Well, thanks very much for the uh, invitation and the opportunity to speak here. Uh, great, those lights are perfect. Now, let's see, uh, as mentioned and as advertised, this is going to be a little bit uh, different set of lectures than, than you may be used to hearing in general, and specifically at, at this particular venue. So I'm going to talk about applied mathematics. I'm going to talk about topology applied to a variety of problems. Now, we all know that uh, mathematics is useful. If we start talking about applications, we often say, well, you know, look at, look at string theory, look at physics, look at things like that. I'm going to take a slightly different tack, given my background and my interests. I'm going to talk more about applications in engineering and systems-based problems. So let's start off. Today's lecture is going to be a, sort of a big picture lecture, meaning I'm going to draw lots of big pictures. I'm not going to stop drawing lots of big pictures. That's the way it's going to be most of the time. Uh, so drink from the fire hose. Here we go. What's applied mathematics? Boy, that's a good way to start a fight in uh, most departments, isn't it? I'm not going to say what applied mathematics is. We can all pretty much agree on some classical examples of, of good applied mathematics. Mathematics is really useful. Calculus, we teach our undergrads this all the time. Why are you suffering through this course? Because it's useful. Uh, linear algebra, why are you suffering through this course, my dear undergrads? Because it's useful. It's very, very useful. And uh, of course, numerical analysis is extremely useful. And those of you chuckling know what this device is. Very good. If you uh, come to the University of Pennsylvania, you can come visit uh, this particular device. Now, those are not the only examples of mathematics out there that are useful. As you already know, these have been astoundingly successful for dealing with uh, all kinds of problems, but not all problems fall to one of these three tools. There are lots and lots of challenges in modern engineering and modern science for which uh, the, the hammer of differential calculus and linear algebra just doesn't seem to get the job done. And we need new mathematics, different mathematics, to become applied in these contexts. Let me just run through a couple of these. Uh, networks, all kinds of interesting problems, challenges going on in science related to, to networks. And um, you know, differential calculus just doesn't plug into this and solve everything that you want to know, especially in the context of things like social networks. Uh, very, very interesting questions there. When you start passing the neuroscience and looking at the, the networks of how your neurons work, uh, tons and tons and tons of open problems. Are you going to write down the differential equation for your brain and solve it? Probably not. You need some different kinds of mathematics. When you move to things like gene regulatory networks or even just uh, sequencing genetic data, there are huge problems associated with very, very large sets of data, very, very large spaces that you're dealing with. These are uh, difficult challenges for mathematicians. If you look at problems, say, associated to protein folding, that seems like classical mechanics. Write down a differential equation. Solve it. There you go. Uh, Moore's law is not going to help you with this problem. The computers will not get fast enough to solve the differential equation. You're going to need some new ideas to solve these kinds of problems. A little bit smaller scale, if you look at what's happening in materials science, there's all kinds of interesting questions for mathematicians that most mathematicians are not touching. There are all kinds of interesting questions associated with small-scale carbon structures that are very, very geometric in nature, and geometers haven't really uh, latched onto it yet. It seems as though we need some new mathematics to solve problems associated with what happens at very, very small or fine scales of matter. Uh, it doesn't have to be small. Organizing uh, systems, large collections of uh, large-scale objects like uh, robots or even biological agents requires some very, very uh, new mathematics in order to get the job done. So of course, what's the novel mathematics that I'm going to be pushing in this lecture series? It's going to be topology. In many respects, topology, though having a, a reputation for being too abstract to be useful for anything, is strangely well adapted for some of these modern problems. Topology is all about uh, robustness, right? Invariance under large deformations. 
That's very, very important when you're talking about global problems, when you're talking about uh, biological systems that have lots and lots of perturbations to them. Topology is all about local to global transitions. Wow, there are a lot of problems in modern systems theory where you have lots and lots of local data and you want global understanding. Topology was built to solve those problems. Okay, so for today's lecture, what I want to do is just give a, a brief overview of a couple of different examples of how topology can be useful in uh, a few engineering contexts. I'm going to emphasize the, the kinds of spaces that come up. This is a gathering of geometric topologists. I think you can all believe that algebraic topology, homological algebra, that's a, that's a pretty direct plug-in. How do you go from local data to global data? And we're definitely going to hit that point in this lecture series. But I want to tease out a little bit more of the, the underlying geometric topology that you might find a, a, a closer connection with. When you do topology, you start off with spaces. You s then pass to mappings between those spaces. And then you start looking at invariants. So let's start at the beginning. We're going to talk about some interesting spaces. Now, you don't need to know much about applications to do this. That's all right. But there is a payoff in both directions. Topology is not only useful to engineering systems. Uh, it, it returns the favor by, in some cases, revealing some interesting spaces that are present in a natural system, organic kinds of spaces, if you will. And they're not as simple as you might anticipate just looking at the problem of Inizio. So let's start off with something that's uh, near and dear to my heart, that, that being robotics. At the University of Pennsylvania, we have a very, very nice robotics lab, the GRASP Laboratory. Lots and lots of toys to play with in there. Lots and lots of interesting mathematics hiding below the surface. Very, very simple example of a, a class of spaces that comes up in robotics that you're all familiar with has to do with configuration spaces. Let's say that you've got some environment, some workspace, and a collection of robots moving about in it. And what is, a, what is important in this system? You got to make sure that the robots don't crash into the walls and don't crash into each other. Because if the robots crash, then, well, you know, you got to fix them, and that costs money, that costs time, and time is money, and this is engineering that we're talking about. So how do you make sure that things don't uh, crash? Well, you build a space that models all the possible states. This is the configuration space. We could start off with the, the mathematician's assumption that these robots are points. And then what we do is we identify a, a workspace. Let's say it's a planar, and we've removed some obstacles where there are things to crash into. Then the configuration space of n points on our domain is just the n-fold product minus the pairwise diagonal, where two robots are at the same place at the same time. So you remove the crashes. Now this is a, what you would call a labeled configuration space. You could uh, quotient out by the action of the symmetric group and get the unlabeled configuration space. Uh, what's the difference between these two from an applied point of view? Well, if you're doing warehousing, where you have to get a package from one place in the factory to another place in the factory, then you want the labeled configuration space. The packages matter, right? You, the post office needs a labeled configuration space. But if you're in a security application, where there's an alarm on campus and a police officer needs to get there quickly, then it doesn't matter which officer gets there. An unlabeled case would be more appropriate. Now, we all know that if you look at the fundamental groups of these uh, spaces without any obstacles, then you get the classical braid groups, the pure braid groups, and then the, the more general braid groups when we quotient out by the symmetric group. And those are very, very interesting groups. Changing the domain in which you're working can change the, uh, the types of braid groups that you get and lead to some interesting problems. Now, of course, in uh, reality, you, uh, you have to fatten up the diagonal a little bit because the robots have size. You might have constraints if you have wheeled robots. But you can do all that. 
there's a, a trade-off between the, the physical system and the configuration space that, that really shows up in some systems. If you have a, 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 a robot arm, the kinds of things that you have in factories in Detroit and elsewhere, then that's certainly a configuration space. More generally, if you have a, a mechanical linkage, some rigid rods with uh, either pin joints or, uh, or ball and socket joints, then you can look at the space of all possible configurations of that. That's a different type of configuration space, but it still leads to some interesting mathematical spaces coming out of it. So for generic uh, lengths and, and uh, constraint types, you, you get manifolds as these configuration spaces. And it's, uh, it's not, well, it's uh, kind of a complex history the, uh, the main theorem in this subject, that if you, uh, if you look even just at planar linkages, so uh, uh, linkages that uh, lie in the plane and that are allowed to cross each other by virtue of uh, a little bit of three-dimensional geometry, then you can get any compact smooth manifold you like as the configuration space of some planar linkage. Again, that theorem has a, a pretty long history with uh, some of these names associated with it. So that's your first hint that these kinds of spaces are pretty rich. Just looking at planar linkages. Okay. Now again, the, the goal is to replace your physical system, your engineering system, with something topological or maybe uh, geometric as well. And then you hope that the kinds of things that you care about on the engineering side have some correlation in terms of the topology or the geometry of the associated configuration space. For example, in a, in a manufacturing process where you're building something and you repeat that process over and over and over, that corresponds to a loop in your configuration space. And knowing something about the loop space is going to help you when you're doing your manufacturing. But uh, does it really help? Or is this one of those examples where you just uh, get a mathematician to, to wave a wand and, and make things look mathematical, but it doesn't actually get used for anything? I'd like to argue that it really does give useful information. Here's, some, uh, here's one example of how a configuration space can be useful in practice. And this comes about combining with a little bit of dynamical systems to put a, a control system in place, one of the things that you can do is set up a vector field on the configuration space. Let's say you want to go to a goal configuration. Then having a vector field that sends everything to that as a, as a sink, as a global minimum, would, uh, would do the job. This actually gets used in practice. Of course, if you want to do a repetitive motion, then you want to get some stable, attracting periodic orbit for your vector field. Now you know and I know that there's a lot of interesting mathematics associated with putting vector fields on manifolds, on configuration spaces in general. One of the interesting engineering challenges is how to, how to really do this in practice. You have to have a good understanding of your configuration space to start off. So, uh, well, I can, you know, draw cartoons here, but it, it's maybe a little bit better to let the, uh, let the pictures speak for themselves. Here's an example of a, a, a video servo that uses a camera and a vector field, a gradient field, on a very, very simple planar configuration space to, to orient a simple robot arm. It's really just flowing down a gradient function. Well, okay, that's not very impressive, but that's, uh, you know, that's a pretty old example. Here's another pretty old example about, well, I don't know, about 15 years old of a uh, robot that was built by Kodacek and his collaborators that does juggling. Again, by having a video camera to, to figure out where you are in the configuration space and then flowing along a vector field that you've put on that configuration space. And the nice part is, is that it's, uh, it's composable. You can, uh, you can add more than one ball and it uh, adapts to it and does the right thing. It takes you onto the stable periodic orbit. And that's kind of nice too, but you know, keep in mind, that's 15 years old. It's come a long way since then. This is an example 
Uh, this is Rex. He is a uh, hexapedal legged robot. And the way, that, uh, the way that Rex runs is by looking at the, uh, the six torus, where each arm has an S1, and uh, programming different gates by programming vector fields on the configuration space. What configuration space? Well, you know, you have to have at least some of the feet on the ground at the same time. And it's not as simple as saying, you know, three on and up to three off. It's a little bit more complicated. It's actually related to uh, what are called moment angle complexes. And Kotacek, who uh, helped invent this, is working with Fred Cohen, the homotopy theorist of Rochester, to understand those moment angle complexes and uh, help program Rex. And Rex is an amazing creature. He can, he can really do some very, very interesting motions if you understand the configuration space correctly and program it well. Okay. So, here's a, uh, here's a slight change from some of the, the configuration spaces that we've been talking about that leads to some interesting mathematics and, and helps return the favor by doing some, uh, some fun examples. So, uh, if you look at AGVs, automated guided vehicles, in a warehousing setting, then uh, these are vehicles that drive around. It takes a lot to build vehicles that have full two degree of freedom driving capability. It takes a lot to control them, it takes a lot to build them. It's a little bit simpler if you uh, build devices that just move on tracks, either uh, electrified guide wires above or optical tracks, painted tracks on the ground with a little camera that makes sure to follow the tracks. It's a little bit easier to uh, control such devices. If you saw the movie uh, WALL-E, there was uh, one of the, what was it, the cleaning robot? Something like that. Uh, worked off of this principle. Very, very common in applications. If you're in that setting, then, then what you're really looking at is a configuration space of points on a, on a graph, on a one-dimensional complex. And uh, as you can see by just playing around with it, the problem of avoiding collisions is qualitatively different than avoiding collisions in 2D. It's like if you've got the, the really wide shopping carts in the really thin aisles, and you know, you're going this way, and the other guy's going that way, and it's, it's war. Someone has to give. That's the way it is. That's, that's very, very different when you're trying to do the controls. How does that appear when you start looking at the topology of the associated configuration space? Well, again, with the ultimate goal in mind of realizing vector fields, the first thing you have to do is get a decent understanding of what the configuration space is like. And now the topologist has the baton and can go off running and, and start proving some theorems about these. And you actually get some interesting spaces out of it. So here's the simplest non-trivial example. If you look at a, a graph that's like the letter Y, You've got three edges with one shared resource, one meeting place. If I take a look at two robots, then what's the configuration space of two points on that graph? Well, <coughs> let's see. This is a uh, one-dimensional complex. I have to take the uh, cross product of it with itself. That gives me a, a two-dimensional complex. It's built out of cubes, or squares, rather. There are nine such two cells, and we have to cut out the diagonal, which again is a copy of this Y graph. If you do that and unfold it, you can get a, a very, very nice visual representation where these dotted lines represent things that you cut out, and this uh, hole in the middle uh, corresponds to where both robots would be at that center location. And you can, uh, you can get a pretty good understanding of what this configuration space feels like. You build a model out of paper. It was a great project for a, a beginning undergraduate to play around with. Now the space is uh, connected, but not simply connected. <coughs> Pardon me. As you can see, if you uh, look at what happens when you, uh, you know, do that kind of thing, this is why I like PowerPoint. I don't have to try and show you this with my fingers. Exchanging positions requires a little bit of a complicated dance, and that's really uh, picking out the generator for the fundamental group here. 
All right, well, that's a pretty simple example. That space has a, a braid group on two elements. That's uh, the integers, just like the plane, in fact. If we start doing some uh, you know, slightly more complicated examples, we get more interesting braid groups, more interesting fundamental groups. But again, these are just two-dimensional complexes with some cuts in them. Not all that complicated as far as spaces goes. If we were to add more points, then we would get higher dimensional spaces, higher and higher. It seems like that might get complicated. But interesting questions. What are the braid groups like? How do they relate to the classical braid groups that you and I know and love? Well, here are a few results. If you have a graph, then uh, the configuration space of points on a graph is a, uh, a very particular type of space. It's a, it's a k pi 1. It's an eilenberg maclean space whose fundamental group classifies everything. All the higher homotopy groups vanish. That's very interesting. Organic examples of k pi 1s are somewhat, somewhat unusual to come across. This tells you that, that you've hit something interesting. And second of all, although the, uh, the dimension of these configuration spaces is really n, the number of robots that, that are on them, the, the essential dimension, the, the, the homological dimension, is much lower in practice. It's really bounded by the number of branching points that you have in your graph. So if I had uh, a dozen robots on this graph, then although the configuration space is 12-dimensional, it can be collapsed down to a, a nice subspace of dimension 4. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. If you start looking at the fundamental groups of these spaces, at the, at the braid groups, <coughs> <coughs> Huh. Oh, the downside of being on video. Video is unforgiving when you're recovering from a cold. If you look at the braid groups, you get some interesting stuff. Um, let's look at a very, very simple kind of graph. Just uh, one central vertex and then k edges coming out of it. Now, according to that theorem that I just said, the uh, configuration space is really, essentially, just a one-dimensional space. So the fundamental group has to be... Got it. Thank you. Ah, I'm glad somebody's awake. Okay, so it's a, it's a free fundamental group. And uh, what's, its, uh, what's its rank? Well, it's some function of the number of robots and the number of edges that you have. And, and you can write down what that is. It's some complicated combinatorial thing. It's not true that uh, all such braid groups are free. If I were to look at a uh, graph like this, I should have done up a slide with that, sorry. Then, uh, you know, these two guys can do their dance and get a generator for the break group. These two guys can do their dance and get a generator for the break group, and they don't interact. They don't know each other at all. It's completely independent. You get a commutator, right? Once upon a time, thanks, sorry about that. Once upon a time, I thought that commutators were really the only thing that you could get, and that all of these braid groups would be Artin right angled. That means they have a presentation, where the only relations are commutators in the generators. That's not true, as proved by Aaron Abrams and Swatkovsky. Uh, they found some very, very simple and beautiful examples. If you look at a complete connected graph on five vertices, then you get a hyperbolic group for the braid group. Also with uh, K33, these two very, very uh, fundamental graphs, just two robots on there, and you get hyperbolic surface groups. And uh, since these are K pi 1s, that tells you that the, the configuration space is really homotopy equivalent to a surface of genus 6 or 4, respectively. Those are interesting groups. Farley and Sabalka. Uh, resolved things completely and showed that uh, you do get an art and right angled braid group on a tree if you have a sufficiently small number of robots or if the tree is a, a linear chain of these star graphs. That's, uh, that's nice. Okay.
that's, uh, that's not at all a complete picture of how topology is, is useful in robotics. Just a little hint. But I want to move on to cover a couple other areas as well. What we just talked about in terms of braid groups of graphs uh, pushes over very, very nicely to some recent work in microfluidics. Microfluidics is uh, the study of, of how you manipulate very, very small droplets of fluids through channels, through tubes, with the goal of setting up a, a laboratory of doing chemistry at very, very small controlled scales. Now, if you want to do that, you have to be able to control very small droplets of fluid. There's some very, very nice work in this area that uh, has a, a discrete character. This is due to uh, Fair in Duke. And uh, what he and his lab does is they uh, suspend droplets in a fluid between two plates and then run wires below the bottom plate and send charges selectively through these wires. This has the effect of influencing the, the surface tension of the droplets and making the droplets move. Again, it's probably best to let the pictures speak. Here's a, uh, an example of a cross section where if you change the current, you can get a droplet to discreetly move from one spot to the next without any trace being left behind. That's pretty cool. These are fairly large scale droplets, like a millimeter or so, but it, 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 it can be done at much finer scales. Now, if you have a, uh, a sort of a, uh, a top-down view, then uh, what you're seeing here is uh, changing the current can change the, the speed at which you're moving. This is, uh, at, at top speed, this is happening at 200 hertz. You have very, very precise digital control of these droplets. And they can move very quickly. And it's not just along a line. You can have a, uh, an arbitrary two-dimensional array, a graph, if you like, that you can manipulate these droplets along. Question? So it's, uh, in this particular experiment, I think it was uh, done with water in an, in an oil-like substrate. You need immiscible fluids. But that's not the important thing. The important thing is just the, the basics of the surface tension and the ability to do surface tension manipulation or electro-wetting so that you can move the droplets. You want this to uh, work with lots and lots of different types of chemicals. The goal being you uh, build a laboratory on a chip where you have a whole bunch of inputs coming in. The droplets move around, manipulate. In this context, it's really interesting because uh, unlike wanting to uh, make sure the robots don't crash into each other, here, you want the droplets to crash into each other and then go back and forth really quickly to do the mixing, have a chemical reaction, and then send the droplets to the corresponding outputs. Now, you don't want to do this one droplet at a time. You want many, many droplets in motion simultaneously. And you want to control. Uh, you want to make sure some things don't collide. Some things do collide at the appropriate place and time so that you get outputs. This is a very, very difficult coordination problem for which something like a configuration space is going to be useful. It's going to be similar to a configuration space of points on a graph, but a little bit more discrete. Now, the graph already has a, a discrete nature to it. When you look at the, uh, the cross product, you get a cubicle complex, naturally. One thing that you can do is look at the maximal cubicle subcomplex, which does not intersect the topological diagonal. This has the effect of saying, well, when you have these robots or droplets in motion, they, they have to move uh, discreetly along edges. They don't stop in the middle somewhere. Once you go, you go. Now, such uh, cubicle complexes are approximations to the configuration space. They tend to be pretty decent approximations. In these contexts, the uh, discretized configuration spaces uh, give you the same homotopy type except for here, where this is disconnected, but this was connected. The question of how good an approximation you get is answered, of course, by taking a refinement and looking at a, a topological limit, 
And one of the things that uh, Abrams proved is that if you refine the underlying graph, then it stabilizes, these discretized configuration spaces stabilize in homotopy type to the topological configuration space, which is what you expect and which is what you want to be true. And there's a lot of interesting results associated to these discretized configuration spaces. In particular, they have a, a local cat zero geometry to them. And that gives you a lot of tools for being able to understand the, n not just the topology, but the geometry of these configuration spaces as well. So a, a couple of theorems that have been proved by others involve classifying uh, braid groups of trees by using the geometry of these discretized configuration spaces. So braid groups of uh, trees uh, aren't right angled in some cases. I mentioned that before. And the way that this is done is by understanding the cohomology ring of the braid groups. Uh, the cohomology ring of the uh, braid group of a tree is, is completely classified. I'm not going to write out the details, but it's done using a discrete Morse theory approach applied to these cubical complexes. This again is by Farley and uh, Lucas Sabalka. So there are a lot of other results that I'll, I'll flash up here pretty quickly for the sake of time for those who are interested in, in the, the, the geometric group theory aspects of this problem. And I should mention that uh, there's an extension of, of these types of spaces um, due to Abrams and myself and Peterson that uh, allows you to do things like have droplets crash into each other and have chemical reactions. And there are some, again, a large amount of very interesting results and open problems associated mostly with uh, the geometric group theory, associated with these very, very interesting spaces. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's move on, talk about a couple other applications. One of the things that we'll spend a lot of time tomorrow talking about is applications to uh, sensor networks and to uh, data aggregation problems. We'll talk a little bit about uh, sheaves and a few other things. Uh, let me just give a hint at how topological spaces are, are useful in a sensor network's context now. If you have an ad hoc wireless network where an individual node broadcasts, its neighbors pick up that signal and then establish a communication link, then you wind up getting a, a graph, a network associated to your nodes, be they sensors or communication devices or whatnot. The important thing is that in many contexts, it's not, uh, not possible or not uh, beneficial to rely on GPS. The nodes know who their neighbors are, but they don't know their coordinates. They don't know where they're located. I'm not trying to knock GPS. GPS is wonderful, if you can get it. But if you have a couple of thousand nodes, it might be expensive to implement doesn't work underwater, doesn't work in an urban canyon, doesn't work underground. Sometimes you just don't know your coordinates. What are you going to do? Of course, you're going to do topology. That's what topology was built for, to do things coordinate free. And if you think about it, if you have a large ad hoc network where the nodes just know who they are and they know the identities of their neighbors, then you've got a data structure that is not at all unlike what you have when you look at a, a simplicial complex or a chain complex. Right? Simplices know who they are, and they know who they're connected to. That's the boundary operator in the chain complex. Very, very similar data structure. We know that uh, topology can extract global structures. The same thing can happen at the level of a wireless or ad hoc coordinate-free sensor network. So for example, what you might do is say, uh, OK, I've got a collection of nodes. I have connections between them. How do, I, uh, how do I figure out what this space looks like? You're looking at it, and you see, oh, there's a hole here. And maybe there are some holes here, but you know, not so much around here. But if you don't have coordinates, you're not allowed to look at this picture. You can't see that. 
one thing you could do is take a simplicial approximation and complete the graph to a simplicial complex. If you choose the largest possible simplicial complex for your graph, that's something called a, a via torus rips complex or a flag complex, more precisely. Then uh, that gives you a topological space that is maybe a, a good approximation to what your underlying sensor network geometry is like. And if you were to look at nodes with sensor regions about them, then uh, trying to figure out where there are holes in the coverage would seem, and indeed is, related to the problem of uh, associating a space to this system and then looking at its holes. How do you figure out where the holes are? Well, you do homology, of course. And so the homology of this underlying flag complex is going to tell you something about coverage problems in sensor networks. That's not the only application to sensor networks, but that's a pretty obvious one. Let's move on, though, and talk about some uh, very, very interesting and compelling work in more general data analysis and statistics and how topological spaces arise there and how some uh, ideas in algebraic topology are very, very important. The type of uh, data sets that we'll be looking at are things called point clouds. You have a collection of points in a Euclidean space. In this context, you are going to know what the coordinates are. Uh, in many cases, because you've got a, uh, a laser scanner that scans some object and associates a collection of points in a three-dimensional space to it. And your problem is to take that scattering of points and figure out what's the underlying space, what's the structure associated with it. Now, you know, you've all done dot-to-dot -dot problems, and you know that you can find structure if you put things together correctly. The question is, how do you put things together correctly? Well, we've had a lot of practice as a uh, species trying to take points and associate structure to them. What's the, what's the right mathematics for doing so? Again, the answer is uh, topology. I'm so glad it's a friendly audience that I'm talking to. If you have the, the coordinates of the points, if you're in a metric context, there are a couple of simplicial approximations that you could use. One would be to, uh, to look at the nerve of a cover. So you have your points, you cover them with balls of a, a particular diameter, and then you look at the nerve of the associated cover. You have simplices depending on the, uh, the depth of overlap of these balls. That's pretty good, but it's awfully hard to compute the nerve. Right? You, you really have to, uh, to be very careful to see whether you've got higher dimensional simplices or not. And it's even harder to store such a complex. If you have 100,000 nodes, uh, you know, how many three-dimensional simplices are you going to have? Well, a lot, potentially. It's a big storage issue. If you use what's called the via torus rips complex, if you just take the flag complex of the one skeleton, so you have a, a simplex if and only if your uh, balls of diameter epsilon uh, are, are all uh, pairwise overlapping, not totally overlapping, then that's not as topologically accurate if you're looking at the union of the balls. But it is really, really easy to compute. You just need pairwise distances, which you've got in the metric. And it's easy to store. You just have to store the graph, and then the simplicial complex is filled out. So the one question that's open is, what do you choose for epsilon? If you've got a collection of points in a space, and you draw balls about them of a particular radius epsilon, if the balls are too small, then you get a spattering of points that doesn't really capture the, the, the shape of the space that you sampled. And so you might look at different epsilons, and you might try to come up with some complex uh, heuristic for which is the appropriate epsilon. Too small, you get dust. Too large, and you get a, a connected blob with no structure in it at all. So what's the right epsilon? Well, um, 
The right answer is you take all the epsilons and you look at the entire sequence. This is something that algebraic topology loves to do. There's more information in the homology of maps than in the homology of the spaces themselves. That's something that we all know. And so if you look at the, the filtration, if you look at the sequence of inclusions as you increase epsilon, then that sequence is going to be what you want to look at. And the significance of a topological feature is going to be related to its, uh, its persistence in this filtration. So if I have a, uh, a feature, a hole in my space that persists over a large parameter range, then that's a, that's a statistically significant feature. That's the idea behind the persistent homology that you may have heard of. So Edelsbrunner, Lecher, and Zomorodian uh, began looking at persistent homology for a sequence of inclusion maps between spaces. And they define the persistent homology as the, the homology of the sequence of inclusions. So again, this class that persists is a persistent homology class. And they argued that these are the, these are the statistically significant features that you should look for. Now, there's a slightly different point of view that, that was introduced when Carlson became uh, active in this area. And this is a, a more algebraic point of view, but a very, very powerful point of view. So consider, a, uh, at, at the more general level, a, a persistence complex where you have a sequence of chain complexes with uh, connecting maps. Again, this is uh, really just the same thing that we had before. Think of the individual chain complexes of these uh, via torus rips complexes, and the chain maps are the inclusion maps. That's the picture that you should have, but algebraically, there's this big structure underneath. Now, if you, uh, if you look at this, this has a, uh, a higher algebraic structure. It has the structure of a module with variable x, x corresponding to these inclusion maps, if you like. What is that module structure? If I if I look at the action of, say, x cubed, then that means you apply x three times. You, you're increasing the size of your epsilon, if you like. Now, with that point of view, what you can do is start trying to classify those modules as a module over your coefficient ring and then a single variable. Now, if your ring is just a general PID, this is not an easy classification to do. But if you're working with field coefficients, then you can classify the homology of this large module. And the classification has a, a particular structure. There are some free portions, and there are some torsional portions in the classification. Now, what does that correspond to physically? What does that, that algebraic decomposition mean? It has a very, very nice physical representation. And these, uh, these coefficients appear as follows. So the, if you were to, uh, to plot a, a parameter for x, which is going to be discrete, but uh, we're going to draw pictures of it as being continuous. And if you draw in the vertical axis the generators that you have for your homology, then some of the generators are free beginning at some parameter value, t sub i. That means that a homology class appears and then persists for all future time. Some of the elements are torsional. They appear at a particular parameter value, r, and then they persist over a length of s, and then they disappear. We saw that in some figures earlier on. And this is the only thing that can happen. You can either have features that appear and then persist, or features that appear and then disappear. That's what the algebraic classification nets you in this context. How do you use that? You can plot these uh, homology classes in something called a bar code where let's say if I, uh, 
restrict to the grading in zero, and I'm just looking at connectivity, then for a small values of epsilon, I have a lot of dust. I have a lot of generators, but most of them go away very quickly as things merge together. And eventually, when everything gets conglomerated into a glob, then there's just one free homology class over this module. So picking a parameter value tells you, in this case, the number of connected components. Of course, this works for the entire homology. We can split it up into different gradings. Uh, something like this would, uh, would count for, for noise, right? That, that, that generator for H2 is, is not statistically significant. Whereas uh, something like this class that persists over a large interval would be more statistically significant. That's the rough idea. Okay, so let me uh, close up the talk with an example that was uh, done by Carlson and his collaborators to show how to use these persistent homology computations to get some previously unknown structure out of a large and complex data set. This is not a three-dimensional data set. It's higher, which means that if you try and uh, visualize it, you're, you're kind of stuck. This comes from the space of natural images. So a while back, some Dutch vision scientists went around with the digital camera and uh, just started taking some pictures of, of scenery, outdoors, buildings, cities, and country. And uh, they mused, what does the space of all natural images look like? It's a very, very high dimensional space, right? The digital camera turns this into pixels. How many pixels? Well, some number of megapixels. You've got your cameras, you know how that works. So it's a very, very high dimensional space, but the space of images in the world that you see is also very, very high co-dimension in that space. If you were to pick a random set of values for pixels, all you'd see is white noise. You'd never see structure. So it's high dimensional, it's high co-dimensional, that's the, the world where uh, topology gets awfully difficult. What does it look like? Well, that's pretty hard. Mumford, yes, that Mumford, uh, came along and said, well, let's look at uh, a simpler version of this problem. Let's focus on the, the sort of micro-local picture where we just take very, very small uh, three by three sub arrays sitting inside of these uh, large images. Let's look at those uh, three by three arrays that have very, very high contrast, so it's not all white or it's not all black. And then let's, uh, let's see if there's some interesting structure inside of that. So what they did was they took these 5,000 images, sampled from it uh, you know, about eight million or so three by three high contrast uh, subarrays at random, built a, a very large data set. What's the uh, data set look like? Well, it's, uh, let's see, uh, each value has an intensity from zero to one, and so you've got nine. That's a data set in R9. If you quotient out by the mean intensity and then uh, projectivize, then you wind up getting a set of data points that lives on a seven-dimensional sphere inside of R8. Okay, so you've reduced the dimension, that's good. But it's still a seven-dimensional sphere, and you have a bunch of points on it, and if you try to, uh, to look at what that space looks like, it, you know, it looks like a mess. You could try to change the two-dimensional projection that you use, and you don't see any structure. There's lots and lots of stuff. So what do you do? Well, to treat this properly, I'd have to go into a couple of slides of the statistical methods used. Let me, uh, let me pull the wool over your eyes and say that what you want to do is uh, filter this data set by some kind of density. Technically, it's called codensity. You, uh, you want to say, okay, uh, am I at a data point that has lots of other data points around it or not so much? That's a parameter, uh, 
And you can filter the data set by that and, and tune what you see. If you include everything, you get a smeared mess. Now, if you look at, say, the persistent first homology of this data set at a particular co-density threshold, so you've thrown out some points of low density, then what you get is the following barcode. You've got a lot of noise at small connection parameters, and then you get one class that persists. What does that look like? Well, it's H1, so it's a circle. If you go back to the data set and extract where this came from, then you wind up getting the following primary circle, where if you look at the three by three grids that you see along that generator for H1, you wind up seeing what? Well, it's a linear gradient from light to dark, and then it's just uh, rotated somehow by your, your field of vision. Okay, well, that's, that's sensible, and in fact, Mumford and Peterson and Lee, the people who originally investigated this data set, saw the same primary circle. And Carlson and company extracted it homologically, but got the same feature. Now, here's where it gets interesting. If you tune the, the density parameter a little bit so that you start including more points, you're throwing less stuff away, and you rerun the persistent homology computation, you wind up getting five statistically significant generators for H1. What does that look like? If you go back to the data set and work it out, it turns out that there are three circles that intersect with the following pattern. And you can check that that has the correct H1. What do those secondary circles correspond to? Well, they correspond to, in one case, uh, vertical structures with uh, uh, changes in the intensity in the horizontal direction. And in the case of the other circle, horizontal structures that vary in their intensity. And notice how it's doing a homotopy from a linear gradient to a quadratic, to a, pardon me, to a linear, to a quadratic the other way, and then back. And notice how these fit together nicely. Okay, so that's interesting. And uh, you might wonder, what is it about the space of natural images that has some bias for the horizontal and the vertical structures that you see? Is it due to gravity? Is it due to the fact that they held the camera like this and not at random angles? Uh, is it the fact that the sensors in the camera have a horizontal and vertical grid? Interesting questions. Okay, but let's, uh, let's keep going. If we think about what's been extracted so far, you have something like a series expansion of the space of natural images that has a, a homological image to it, right? If you look at uh, H0, the persistent H0, there wasn't anything there, it was, it was very simple. That corresponded to just contrast. But when we looked at H1, we had a, a primary circle of linear gradients and then some secondary circles with some quadratic terms in them. Now just like in a Taylor expansion, it's the low order stuff that is easy to extract. The higher order stuff is more delicate. But if you move to the higher order terms to H2, what do you come up with? Well, you have to be much more careful about your density thresholding and you have to do some, some careful statistics. But when you do so, you extract the following generator for a persistent H2. And it looks like this, where I'm drawing it as an identification space, and I'm labeling the, uh, the green primary, uh, pardon me, the green and red secondary circles. It's being identified top and bottom. And then uh, the blue primary circle, when it runs off to the right, it comes back down here, and then back up here. And you can see that this gives you a very, very simple identification space that you've seen before that corresponds to a Klein bottle that is sitting naturally inside this, uh, this very high dimensional data set. This is something that is new, that people who had been working on cracking this data set for years had not seen and not noticed. And it winds up being uh, having some implication in terms of trying to write down image compression 
algorithms exploiting this natural climb bottle that sits inside there. Again, a very, very nice piece of work. This is not the cutting edge of what Carlson and company are doing. There's a lot of stuff that they've done after this corresponding to data sets associated with uh, a lot of biological systems in particular. Some other stuff associated with vision as well. Rather than talk about that, let me, uh, let me wrap up the talk by just making a pitch for topologists to think about interesting topological spaces sitting inside of physical systems that I don't know how to do, that doesn't seem to have really been touched, that mathematicians don't seem all that interested in, but they should be. I think a lot more mathematicians should be thinking about material science. Uh, you know, you open up the science journal and you see something new about uh, carbon nanotubes, or carbon sheets. Carbon is a wonderful, wonderful structure. And if you just start pulling up random pictures of what people are building out of carbon, it's the kind of stuff that should get a mathematician really interested. Is there a moduli space for all the different things you can build out of carbon, for example? That's a question that I don't think material scientists are thinking along those lines. I think they're thinking, let's try to build something else. Let's see, let's see if we can build something else. What's the global structure, the space of all things that you can build? Likewise, besides carbon, there's a lot of work in something called uh, self-assembly. How many people have heard of self-assembly? Yeah, one. I haven't even heard of it. This is very, very foundational in what's happening in small-scale science. Um, a fun experiment. Go home, uh, get a sink full of water, get some uh, drinking straws and a pair of scissors, and just tut, 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 snip, 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 cut them, and then uh, lay them like, uh, like little discs in the, uh, in the sink full of water, and you know what'll happen? Surface tension effects will make them float together. And they will form what? What do they form? Ooh. They'll form a hexagonal lattice. The same thing will work with hot dogs if you slice them thinly. Uh, you know, some people don't like hot dogs. Whatever, drinking straws, hot dogs, one yen coins if you're careful. Uh, you get structures that assemble themselves. If you, uh, if you take uh, little tiles of thin plastic and you paint the edges with hydrophobic or hydrophilic material, you can program the pieces to float and assemble together in more interesting structures. People would like to be able to program very, very small scale devices, pop them in a tank, shake the tank, and then get iPhones to come out. <laughs> uh, and don't laugh because some of your LCD screens are built using these kinds of techniques very, very interesting spaces sitting inside here for assembly and disassembly. Mathematicians really have not touched it. Lots of interesting topology here. And even better is the kinds of spaces that are, are hiding behind biology. I know they're hiding in there. I'm just not quite sure what they are. Here's my favorite candidate. This would be diatoms. You ever looked at pictures of diatoms? These little, uh, these little gooby guys that are, are like glass skeletons. They have these silicate skeleta. And they come in all kinds of different shapes. They live in, in the ponds. And uh, if you look at them, you think, oh my god, somebody programmed these things to build into interesting structures. I want to know how how this happens. I mean, how do you get these beautiful shapes? There have to be some simple assembly rules associated with this. Now, biologists have been, uh, by and large, stymied with how to classify diatoms. They're trying to find a moduli space for these shapes, for these creatures. Mathematicians ought to be contributing to that. Do you see this picture? Does this picture get you excited? This picture gets me very excited, right? What is that? That's negative curvature right there. Wow, right? When uh, people are doing self-assembly, they always make flat lattices. Sometimes they make spherical shells. I've never seen someone self-assemble negatively curved objects, except Mother Nature. 
that's some pretty cool stuff. I have no idea how to build a moduli space for diatoms, but somebody ought to do it because these are very interesting objects. And with that, I think I'm going to uh, thank you for your patience and end. Thanks.